in Jonah chapter 3, uh, the Lord speaks to Jonah again, gives him the same commission to go to Nineveh, and this time uh, Jonah obeys. And chapter 3 uh, deals with uh, the results of uh, his going and his preaching to Nineveh. Uh, let me begin by reading chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So uh, Jonah went, uh, arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Now, Jonah is the only prophet, prophet who had to be given the same assignment twice. The text does not indicate how long it was after the fish vomited uh, Jonah onto dry land before God called Jonah again. Uh, but regardless of that, this does indicate God's compassion. Uh, and, uh, you know, Jonah was given a second chance. Uh, as one commentary says, God does not give us one shot at responding in faithfulness to his call. He is the God of the second chances. God will never give up and quit on us. Um, now, the fact, however, is that, uh, as with the ship captain who said, call upon your God and perhaps he may save us. Uh, and the king, as we'll get to chapter 3, verse 9, says, who knows uh, he may spare us. We cannot presume upon the Lord's grace or put him to the test because there are many biblical examples where a person received no second chance. For example, Moses, when he struck the rock, instead of speaking to it, as God said, God said, because you did that, you are not going to enter the promised land. God didn't give him another chance. Um, Saul, in, in 1 Samuel 15, he had been told to do something uh, to destroy all of the Amalekites and, and the uh, uh, sheep and the cattle. He didn't do that. And as a result, the kingdom was taken from him. Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't get a second chance. Um, and so there are many other such examples. God is the God of second chances, but we cannot presume upon him. And the lesson, of course, is when you know what you should do, do it. Do it the first time. Now, in chapter 3, verse 2, the ESV repeats the translation uh, of chapter 1, verse 2, call out against it, call out against the city. But there's actually uh, a subtle difference in the wording between the two commissions. In chapter 1, verse 2, Jonah was to proclaim against the city. Here in chapter 3, verse 2, he is to proclaim to the city. Um, and now most translations correctly recognize this and translate it. For some reason, the English Standard Version, which is one uh, which, along with the New American Standard, is probably, they are probably the two most literal translations, it gets it wrong here. Um, and this is not simply a change in prepositions, uh, but it's basically saying there's a slightly different substance. It's not just a death sentence, uh, but a message. Um, and that is corroborated by the fact that in chapter 1, uh, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh because their evil has come up before me. That reasoning has not been repeated here in chapter 3. Um, and so literally what God tells Jonah in chapter 3 here is to proclaim the proclamation that I tell you. Um, and uh, so now, much has been written 
about uh, what it says in chapter 3, verse 3, uh, that uh, Nineveh was three days journey. Uh, some take this to refer to the size of Nineveh and to its diameter or circumference or to the circumference of the administrative district of which uh, Nineveh was the hub. Some take it to be hyperbole. Uh, some think it refers to the length of time necessary for uh, Jonah to proclaim uh, the message. And I have the different views and and authorities who support each one in your book. Uh, but when it says that uh, in chapter 3, verse 3, that uh, Nineveh was a great city requiring a three days journey, this suggests, the way it's worded, that the primary emphasis here is not on the physical size of Nineveh, but it primarily relates to God's motive uh, for doing what he is doing in comparison or in contrast with Jonah's motives. <clears throat> because, and I think we can see that, because as I said, although the command is repeated from verse 1, the wording is different, and the reason about Nineveh's sin, again, is not repeated here in verse 3. And so, uh, this is indicating that um, when it talks again about Nineveh being a great city, this is indicating Nineveh was important to God, but obviously it's not important to Jonah. Now, verse 4 contains Jonah's only prophetic words. And again, this is why uh, one of the reasons why the book of Jonah is different from all other books of prophecy, because all other books of prophecy primarily consist of the words of prophecy that the prophet says. Uh, here, Jonah's only prophetic words are this. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He doesn't even proceed it by saying, Thus saith the Lord, uh, or by even naming God. Um, and now the number 40 is often used in the Bible in connection either with judgment or testing. Uh, and uh, we, we, I mean, the rain uh, at the time of the flood uh, for 40 days and 40 nights. I give a couple of other uh, scriptural citations uh, for the significance of the number 40. And the same is true for the word overthrow. <clears throat> the same word for overthrow used here was used in Genesis 19, which talked about Sodom and Gomorrah being overthrown. Um, and certainly that's what uh, would have been conveyed or connoted to the Ninevites, and that's certainly what Jonah wanted to happen. However, there is an ambiguity in the term uh, overthrown. It's a participle which may be understood reflexively as well as passively. What does that mean? It means that while it can refer to Nineveh will be overthrown, like Sodom and Gomorrah were, it can also mean it will overturn itself. Um, and the 40 days provided the opportunity for repentance, and the wording here uh, that is used allow for the possibility that God might choose to relent from destroying the city if the people overturn their own attitudes, if they repent. Um, in essence, uh, you know, and so God could still be true to his word by relenting from destroying the city. Uh, it's kind of a uh, an example of uh, God's message is, I will have mercy on those whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Uh, that quotation originally is from Exodus 33, verse 19. And the context there was God's choosing not to destroy the Israelites in the wilderness for having worshipped the golden calf. Now, here in Jonah, that principle is being extended to include Gentile pagans, and thus it is anticipating the full New Testament revelation of God's character, because Jesus came uh, to die for people of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people in the world, 
while we were yet sinners. And so the principle that was announced initially uh, in uh, Exodus 33 pertaining to Israel, the principle is now extended to Gentiles and it receives its full fruition in Jesus. So once again, we're seeing the book of Jonah is, is typological. It's pointing forward. It's extending principles that had previously applied to Israel. Um, but And that's what makes Jonah so angry. Uh, it, it, extending this principle of Exodus 33.19 to include Gentile pagans, particularly Assyrians, the enemies of Israel, um, you know, it, it offends him personally. It offends his sense of justice. Um, but, you know, it should challenge us. Uh, we're challenged by what God is really like, what his sovereignty implies, and what his grace really means. Now, but we need to understand something about biblical prophecy. A lot of people think that prophecy just means predicting the future. Of course, there is that element, but primarily biblical prophecy uh, was uh, interested in the present as much as the future. It was designed to change people's lives. And so, uh, and we talk a lot about this, by the way, in our book on biblical eschatology, when we talk about the nature of prophecy. Most of the biblical prophets essentially had a twofold message and ministry. They warned people of the consequence of disobedience uh, and the, by what are known as oracles of judgment, and they called the people uh, back to faithfulness uh, to repentance by oracles of salvation. Their message essentially was, if you continue to do this, judgment will come. But if you follow the Lord and repent, then blessings will come. Um, and as such, all prophecy, even prophecy that seemed absolutely clear on its face, kind of like Jonah's prophecy, had a an element of contingency. Um, and so, that actions taken in response to a prophecy might either postpone or hasten its fulfillment. Um, and so, uh, as a prophet, Jonah would have known this. Uh, and so, while he was expecting Nineveh would be overthrown and destroyed like Sodom was, because, even though his prophecy did not say, if you repent, then God will relent. No, but he knew that's the character of God, and that is the true nature of biblical prophecy. God is primarily interested in changing our behavior, and he uses the prophets to do that. Now, in verses 5 through 9, it says this. Um, I'm at 6 now. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and uh, published throughout Nineveh. By this decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but uh, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Now, the contrast between the pagan Ninevites uh, to their receipt of the word of the Lord compared to that of Jonah is highlighted here. Although Jonah had not even named God, the people clearly recognized God's voice. And in chapter 3, verse 5, it says they believed God. Now, the Hebrew preposition there indicates that they believed in him. Um, and uh, so this indicates that they were correctly responding to the character of God, even though they had only limited knowledge of who he was. Sackcloth was commonly worn when someone was in mourning, and it showed humility, and the people were humbling themselves uh, before God. And their fasting indicated the same thing. The king's response, beginning in verse 3, similarly shows his sincerity um, and uh, shows that uh, he did 
the same kind of things the people had already done spontaneously. Um, they, uh, he asked them to call out to God, and who knows, he may relent. That's And the calling out to God, it's the same word used in chapter 3, verse 8, as was used in chapter 1, verse 14, by the sailors about calling out to the Lord. Um, now, verse 9 indicates the freedom of God to act as he pleases. His graciousness may be hoped for, but it can never be presumed upon. And the who knows, that's, e again, equivalent to the ship captain saying, perhaps, in chapter 1, verse 6. Um, now, that phrase uh, occurs in only two other places in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 12, regarding David's fasting for his infant son. Who knows? He might live. And Joel 2, verse 14, the people fasting during a locust plague. Um, and so again, it shows divine, uh, you know, the contingency here. It shows divine sovereignty, but the contingency that God may relent uh, from what he has said he would do if the people respond appropriately. Now, in verse 10, it talks about God's response uh, to uh, the repentance and the actions of the king and the people of Nineveh. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Now, God saw how those people turned from their evil way. Um, and the language, and he did not destroy them. The language picks up uh, the language of, of verse 8b, where it says, uh, where the king said, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. And they did so. It shows that God's response corresponded to the people's hope and it demonstrated the validity of the people's belief in God. Um, and, you know, it also raises, again, the issue of knowing the will of God, yet obeying or choosing to disobey. Jonah knew God well. And the irony is, he had and knew the word of God, yet he did not accept that word and chose to disobey it. Where, or obey it only reluctantly, as we will see. The Ninevites, like the sailors, only had an intimation of what God required and an intimation of who God was. And yet they acted fully on what they did know, and God honored that. Um, in fact, as we will see in chapter 4, the only person in this book who does not fully repent is Jonah himself. The uh, Sailors did, the Ninevites did, um, and in uh, God's reply, uh, in verse 10, where it says, he relented, the same word is used there for the people's repentance. And so some translations, I believe the old King James says, and God repented now uh, of his plan to destroy Nineveh. Now, the wording here, for God obviously cannot mean repent in the same way that the people repented, because God does not sin. Rather, uh, the wording indicates God's sorrow for the consequences the people must face as a result of their sin. Uh, and this sorrow is expressed in his compassion. Uh, and consequently, I believe that God's relenting is the proper terminology here. Um, furthermore, it's uh, interesting that the only uh, time the combination of the hope that God might turn from his fierce anger and relent uh, from the disaster he threatened is only found here in chapter 3, verse 9, and in Exodus 32, verse 12, where Moses pleaded that God uh, that you would turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster. In other words, not destroy the people in the wilderness for worshiping the golden calf. And his relenting from the harm he had promised in chapter 3, verse 10, uh, is almost 
a word-for-word -word repetition of his relenting from destroying the people after the golden calf episode, uh, from the statement in Exodus 32, verse 14, and the Lord relented from the disaster he had spoken of bringing to his people. Um, and uh, so verse 10 uh, shows there's an intersection between God's transcendence, his being, where he's separate and apart from creation. He has a plan in advance, and that does not change. But also his imminence. In his actions, God is immediately present with his creation, and he interacts with people in time and space, and thus he appears to change. Now, uh, the uh, you know another example of that is in Ephesians 1 uh, and 2, where God sees believers as dead, buried, uh, sealed, and also raised and ascended. In other words, he sees us as dead and buried. But then it says we're sealed. And then he sees us, chapter 2, verse 6, as raised up and ascended to heaven. You know, so he sees these things uh, in a transcendent way because he is outside of time. And yet he interacts with us uh, to save us, as we saw, I believe, in the last lecture. You know, by grace we're saved through faith. He works in our heart in space and time, and we respond in faith. Now, I want to conclude this lecture uh, by looking at the first four verses of chapter 4, because these show Jonah's response to what God has just done. Uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. But it displeased uh, God's relenting. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Now, this scene reveals that although Jonah was thankful in chapter 2, in his prayer, that God had spared his life, he, re he Jonah, really had not repented of his self-centeredness and of his hatred of the Assyrians. And the word but, which begins chapter 4, uh, verse 1, but it displeased uh, Jonah, points up the contrast between God's compassion uh, and Jonah's displeasure and anger. I mean, Jonah is angry that someone, namely the Ninevites, did not die. At the end of this section, he's angry, uh, well, at the end of chapter 4, he's angry that a vine, that we will see in the next lecture, did die. Now, Jonah's prayer here, he's, he offers this prayer uh, in the beginning of chapter 4. Uh, it's amazing uh, the uh, comparison between it and and his prayer in chapter 2 from the belly of the fish. Um, ironies abound here. In fact, it's kind of ironic to even call Jonah's prayer in verses 2 and 3 a prayer. Now, yes, we always need to be honest with God and not attempt to hide our feelings. And that includes our feelings of bitterness and anger. But Jonah's prayer here in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, is essentially nothing but a diatribe against God. Uh, you know, in chapter 2, his prayer, he talks about how God answered me and heard my voice. He speaks of your holy temple. He calls the Lord my Lord, speaks of God's steadfast love and all that God has done. And he concludes with thanksgiving because salvation belongs to the Lord. Well, here in chapter 4, Jonah uses God's own character uh, in order to attack God and justify Jonah's own flight and disobedience. I mean, the arrogance here is breathtaking, and the egocentric, me-centered basis of this prayer is found in the fact that the words I or mine occur no fewer than nine times in the original. And although verse 2 is translated, this is what I said, the actual Hebrew word uh, reads, uh, 
my word. In other words, Jonah is setting my word against your word. And also, he is quoting God's own description of himself in Exodus 34, uh, verses 6 and 7, uh, against God. Remember, in Exodus 34, uh, God described himself. Um, and uh, Exodus 34, uh, verses 6 and 7, say this. Uh, they say, The Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's verse 6. Let me end it right there, because verse 6 concludes by saying, abounding in steadfast love, the word said, and faithfulness. But Jonah, in his prayer here in chapter 4, changes that to abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Now, the substitution is intentional, and he's using it in an argumentative way. Um, and actually, the, uh, the uh, wording, uh, the literal translation, uh, beginning in verse 1, where it says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, the literal translation is, but it was evil to Jonah with great evil. What he saw God doing in sparing thousands upon thousands of people was great evil to him. Um, and so, just remember, he's quoting, but then changing the wording from Exodus 34, verse 6. That arose, again, out of the golden calf incident. Think about this. Jonah owed his very existence to God's being merciful in connection with the golden calf, because otherwise Israel wouldn't exist, and then Jonah wouldn't exist. Jonah also owes his existence to God's mercy by uh, having the great fish swallowing him. But now Jonah is using and actually misusing scripture to attack God and justify himself. He's using God's own mercy, grace, and hesed against God. This is absolutely amazing, and yet he still remains a prophet of God. Um, he is angry uh, that God's concern is universal. And he's saying he would prefer death to serving a God who did not conform to his own theology, namely that mercy should be extended only to Israel, um, but should not be extended to Israel's enemy. Uh, as David Dorsey summarizes, in the first prayer, in chapter 2, Jonah praises Yahweh for sparing him, one person, from the punishment he deserved, although apparently he has still not repented of his disobedience. Whereas in the second prayer, here in chapter 4, Jonah is angry that God has spared many thousands of innocent children, as well as people who have sincerely repented. In other words, Jonah wants to receive God's grace without being changed by it, and at the same time, snatch away God's grace from those whose lives, in fact, have been changed by it. It brings to mind Jesus' parable uh, of the two slaves in Matthew 18, uh, who uh, one owed uh, the king a debt he could never repay, thousands upon thousands, and the king forgave him. But then he uh, refused to uh, forgive somebody who only owed him a small amount of money. Um, and that's kind of what's going on here in Jonah. And when Jonah says in verse 3, it's better for me to die than to live, they not, that reveals his hatred for the Ninevites and how much he does not want to see them come to faith in the Lord, to the point he would do anything, even die, if that's what it took to have them wiped out. And again, the amazing thing, thing is, with all this, his attitude, he still remains a prophet of God. Now God, in the next section of chapter 4, and in the next lecture, God deals with this, and we will see how God deals with this. Um, and God's question to end chapter 4, do you do well to be angry, reflects a similar question he asked Cain. Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? Um, 
And you see, as the Apostle James says in James 1, our sin arises from within us. Uh, James says, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it, accomplished, it brings forth death. You see, temptation and sin is internal, not external. We are responsible for everything we do. We may be placed in circumstances where there are temptations, but whether we choose to be tempted and go along with them is our own responsibility. It's something inside our hearts and minds. And that's why Jesus said, it is out of the heart that comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. So ultimately here, you know, when God asks the question, do you do well? Are you right to be angry? This goes to our fundamental attitudes towards ourselves, to others, and our most important values and priorities. Because out of these values and priorities flow all the sins, discord, and evil in our lives. And as a result of that, God will judge. What he's saying is he wants to spare us this judgment if we, like the Ninevites, like the sailors, would simply repent and change our attitudes and change our ways. God's further dealing with Jonah we will, will take place in the rest of chapter 4, which we will deal with in the next lecture.